The Comanches didn't care enough to also have their section of the book narrated by third-person omnipotent Cormac God Daddy. When I was in high school, I fell in love with Cormac McCarthy's novels, and I started to question how McCarthy got so good. Was it talent or was it hard work? Does Cormac McCarthy do the common writing advice we all hear as beginner writers? And for the last couple days, I've been exploring all of Cormac McCarthy's works, looking for similarities and methods, things that he does over and over again. And something that Cormac has done now 12 times in his career is write a first line in a novel. And the first line of his first novel, The Orchard Keeper, went like this, quote, the, cr- the tree was down and cut to lengths. The section spread and jumbled over the grass. So when I hear that line and I think about how much Cormac McCarthy cared about the first line of The Orchard Keeper, I think he cared as much as Anton Chigger in No Country for Old Men. I mean, it's not the greatest line. Once again, we'll read it again. The tree was down and cut to lengths. The section spread and jumbled over the grass. And I want to make this of, of, this as objective as possible because I don't care what comes after. I love all of, all of his books. I understand that th- these lines may lead to something, but what about the first line? That is such a common piece of writing advice. I've been friends with people who run big publishing um, or not publishing houses, journals, And they tell me that they already know within a paragraph if it's going to be good or not, and they stop after a paragraph. So, okay, The Orchard Keeper was a little bit underwhelming, but that was him getting his start. What did McCarthy bring to Outer Dark, his second novel on the table? He is poor. He is now divorced from his wife. He is out here wandering around. What is he going to put down on the table for us? Here we go. This is a long one. They cre- this is the lo- is this the longest sentence in opening line? I mean, that's the way to hack how you know how to make an opening line interesting, an opening sentence. Excuse me. You just make it go on for like a whole page. They crested out on the bluff in the late afternoon sun, with their shadows long on the sawgrass and burnt sedge, moving single file and slowly high above the river, and with something of its own implacability pausing and grouping for a moment and going on again strung out in the silhouette against the sun and then dropping under the crest of the hill into a fold of blue shadows with light touching them about the head in spurious sanctity until they had gone on for such a time as saw the sun down altogether and they moved in shadow altogether which suited them very well. So there is a lot to unpack there. But the first thing I want to talk about is how does Cormac McCarthy get away with writing such a long first sentence? And it's his use of gerunds. And gerunds are words that end in ing. And when I was first shown the power of gerunds, it changed my life. It was like I started using meth. All my writing, whether it was academic, poetry, whatever, was just filled with gerunds. I was so inundated with gerunds, I was on a date with a girl at a coffee shop. And she wasn't that interesting, so I was just listening to the words that she was saying, and she was using a ton of gerunds. And after she finished some crazy story about her Trump traumatic life because her dad was a cop, I, I, I looked at her and I said, man, you use a lot of gerunds. That must really be affecting you. And she went, what? Um, so I was so gerund out. But McCarthy, especially in The Orchard Keeper and Outer Dark, are really playing on the gerunds because a secret that a lot of great writers used to use is that if you... Use more gerunds and active verbs or verbal adjectives, words that end in ed, you can use less punctuation. And one of the many sub pinnacles of writing is being able to take an audience through a flow that never ends, take them through these ideas. And in this passage, we learn a lot if we examine it, especially like if we look at the last sentence, they moved in the shadow all all together, which suited them very well. We're starting to see, we're being introduced to these people, to this group who will later find out our brother and sister, but we've been given an idea that something ominous is coming, that there is this darkness in there. So I have to give Outer Dark a classic for this one. This is one of the best opening lines. This really shows some of McCarthy's prose. So next we have one of McCarthy's weirder books, and the name has made so many people read it. So, so many people have read Child of God, like even though I think it's maybe McCarthy's worst novel, in my opinion, so many people have read it more than other books. Like when I talk to people about Cormac McCarthy, all you guys out there, everyone's on the list of books you guys have read are always Child of God, even before Sutri and the Border Trilogy and like some of the other classics sometimes. So Child of God is almost like a remix or grew out of Outer Dark. It was like one of those sub quests and something that McCarthy wanted to explore that he really couldn't get or fit into Outer Dark, or maybe he just felt like it was an easy avenue to create another short book about, you know, Lester Ballard. 
And when I think of McCarthy's life and what he was doing here, he was finalizing some of his use of violence because in Outer Dark and The Orchard Keeper, we see some violence, but it's not as descriptive. It's not really moving toward what we're going to see in Blood Meridian or Sutri. Some of the darker characters and some of that energy had never really become outward manifest in McCarthy's work, works yet. In The Orchard Keeper and Outer Dark, they, it was very symbolic. Like Kenneth Ratner in The Orchard Keeper is a symbol of darkness. Cola deals with the Trinity at the end and throughout Outer Dark, but the violence and the craze isn't as overt. And so let's see if the first line of Child of God has anything to do with some of the themes of the book. Quote, They came like a caravan of carnival folk up through the swales of broom straw and across the hill in the morning sun. The truck rocking and pitching in the ruts and the musicians on chairs in the truck bed teetering and turning their instruments. The fat men with guitar grinning and gesturing to others in a car behind and bending to give a note to the fiddler who turned a fid fiddle peg and listened with a wrinkled face. So once again, a heavy use of verbs here, a heavy use of verbal adjectives, words that end in ED. And I'm feeling like we don't get that much description here. We, I'm, I'm seeing an image and it feels weird. However, the mystery, the excitement, all those things really don't come up for me when I read this. So I feel like he cares about this as much as, as his love life. He tried, but they... His wives didn't try hard enough. His first wife needed to get a second job one month after she just had a baby as, so Cormac could write all day even though he hadn't even received an advance for the orchard keeper yet. It's not him. It's them. Every so next we move on to McCarthy's Southern masterpiece, Sutri. And this one's a wild one because I actually have gotten some people into Sutri lately, like some people in my personal life, people who have I've got I've had read some Cormac McCarthy f before, like mostly The Road, The Border Trilogy, like No Country for Old Men, the easy stuff. However, none of them are liking Sutri. None of them made it very far, but they were like, "What was that prologue? What was that first part about?" And we're about to read that right now. "Quote, dear friend, now in the dusty clockless hours." of the town when the streets lie black and steaming in the wake of the water trucks. And now when the drunk and the homeless have washed up in the lee walls and alleys or abandoned lots and cats go forth high shouldered and lean into the grim perim in the grim perimeters about now in these sooth black brick or cobbled corridors where light wire, light wire shadows make a Gothic harp of cellar doors, none shall walk save you. I mean, this is some of the most epic shit that I've ever seen everyone. Like this is, beautiful like oh my god like he's going crazy here he is firing on all cinder cylinders with this i mean i'm just going to read one more time this this bottom section now in these sooth black brick or cobbled corridors where light wire shadows make a gothic harp of cellar doors none shall walk save you i mean honestly that's wild do i know exactly what's going on here as a someone who is reading for the first time absolutely not However, when you examine this line by line and you kind of, you, you put periods in your head, it actually is very intriguing, even just the first part. Dear friend, now in the dusty clockless hours of the town when the streets lie black and steaming in the wake of the water trucks. You can tell that you're reading something beautiful. The, the prose is there. The, when I read that for the first time, it felt gold. It felt like just like there was a, not a mist, like a gold it was, a, it was like an infinite golden hour happening and maybe that see that corresponds new look, look what he said he he made me feel that with the dusty clockless hours he ropes you in by saying dear friend like this is something beautiful you're being being ridden to and just kind of being sucked into this you know this weird sense of time moving back into Sutri into Cormac McCarthy's life so I for sure think that this is teetering on fire but I think it's going to be a classic and I'll rank I'll rank these um I think Sutri's, this is better than Outer Dark for sure. Um, but I don't think it's fire. I've read some fire intros before, but I don't think that this is it. I think it's a little bit odd. It can be hard. I remember the first time I read this when I was in high school. I, I was like, WD, until they got to prison, I was like, I have no idea what the hell is going on here. So next we have the one, everyone, the shortest one, Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. And this is going to piss some people off, but... It's not very long. Uh, it's see the child. And this is actually really cool because, you know, I could just throw this down here in hot trash. Like, dude, this means nothing. Like, the book's great, but this means nothing. But what book do you know that starts off like that? Like, you could you could start, uh, many books start off by describing a child or describing something. But who in the third person omnipotent says, see the child? Like, that. that's quite a way to start. And I would say that he cared about this as much as, as his love life. 
You know, he doesn't keep this tonality throughout the whole novel. This is like the intro. So he did care about this. But the Comanches didn't care enough to also have their section of the book now uh, narrated by third-person omnipotent Cormac God Daddy. And, <laughs> and I can't see that it's really better than Child of God because it just doesn't have enough substance. So next we have McCarthy's coming out party. He switches authors. They tell him, they take him in the back room and they say, Hey, son, we're going to make you great. You're going to be a big star. You know, with all the pretty horses. Like, they had to know. Like, they had to know when they signed Cormac McCarthy, and this dude had been selling 5,000 novels, that there was just this class of guys like you and I. I say guys because this channel, other than a couple a couple females out there, is mostly men for the Cormac McCarthy stuff, at least. And they had to have known that they could sell some books that were, if they marketed it the right way. Like, what Random House does, if you, I have been reading and, like, doing research on, like, the covers and the descriptions of the novel and how many units got sent out and how confident they were in McCarthy. And they weren't confident at all. They had no idea what to do so bad that a lot of the like flaps, the inside like descriptions about the novel were written by Cormac McCarthy because even his editor, Albert Eskrin, like was confused at times about how to actually describe what the hell was going on in the novel for a general audience. And how well good is McCarthy at doing that? Maybe now he's a lot better, as we've seen with the Santa Fe Institute. But that's not the writer's job most of the time, unless you're a self-publisher, to do that. That's a totally different brain. That's copywriting. So for the first time ever, Cormac McCarthy, I think that even he knows that he's going to get this boost. So he writes this first line. He turns in the final, final, final manuscript of it all. And this is what he tells the 200,000 people that are about to read it six months after release. The candle flame and the image of the candle flame caught in the pure glass, twisted and righted when he entered the hall and again when he shut the door. And this is decent. I mean, I would have to say that this is good because it is creating some action. I've never thought about that before, the movement of the candle flame when someone is walking in. We understand now that someone has walked into the room but it's done in a very eloquent and kind of random way. Is this great, though? Did Cormac McCarthy really care that much? You know, All the Pretty Horses has a lot of flatness to it. A lot of the characters at times don't, like the whole Border Trilogy in general, you could say, uses uses very weird minimalism, And but then McCarthy turns up the pressure at times, you know, with subtle stuff like, no spoilers, but yes. So I would say that he cared as much as Anton Chigurh with this Chigurh. Chigurh? I'm sorry, I keep saying it wrong. I think it's Chigur. For sure better than the Orchard Keeper, though. So we have the follow-up, though. Cormac, okay, boom, we have the follow-up. This did so well. I finally have the fan, a fan base for the first time. Am I going to, as Cormac McCarthy, follow the tip to really care about the first line? And Cormac says, quote, When they came south out of Grant County, Boyd was not much more than a baby. And the newly formed country they'd named Hidalgo was itself little older than the child. And this is actually, I think, somewhat good because we're getting for the first time some actual description of a character. We have a name. We have Boyd, you know, Billy Parham, Boyd, Boyd Parham, even though we don't know that. And he was a baby and he's coming to this new country, this new land that was basically unsettled because it was barely older than this little baby. So I think that that is actually better that he cared. He cared about this as much as he cared about Boyd. Didn't care enough, obviously, but I think it's a decent opening. I actually kind of like this one. So next we have Cities of the Plains. Quote, they stood in the doorway and stomped the rain from their boots and swung their hats and wiped the water from their faces. And once again, this has some decent description in there because if we look, they stomped the rain from their boots and swung their hats and wiped, you know, so we have hats and boots and they're walking into a doorway. That automatically gives cowboy vibes, right? That gives a Western vibe. Like they stood in the doorway and they're stomping off their boots and their and and their hats from the rainwater. That feels like a western. That feels really good. That's a pretty decent opening, um, just for what it's doing. It does give some description. So I think that he actually, you know, cared about this one. And I don't know if this was a part of the screenplay, Cities of the Plain, if he had that in and just kind of brought it over, because this seems something like a screenplay, like you know, directing like what someone's going to do. They're going to walk in and be stomping in the saloon or wherever they're at. So I think, I think this is a decent one for sure. Better than all the pretty horses. So next we have, there's now a break for, I think we have a break after cities of the plane for, you know, a good seven years, seven, eight years before we get no country for old men, which was also originally a screenplay. So I would say if I had to guess, I haven't seen it. I would, you know, Cormac McCarthy scholars out there, if you, 
if you're watching this, which I know you probably aren't, let me know if the first line of the screenplay is the first line of the novel. So let's start it off. When he woke in the woods in the dark. Oh, sorry. That's that's the road. Excuse me. Here's No Country Full of Men. I sent one boy to the gas chamber at Huntsville. And, you know, this is wild. This is actually a wild one because this is what you want. This was what you this is what people ask for when you have an opening line, like a writing teacher. Like that is a classic good one. I mean, and it has to go in the classic because it does create intrigue. It is like, whoa. Because when he, we hear a gas chamber, we think of the Nazis, we think of the Jews. Like that brings a certain weight and connotation to it. And then describing if I don't know if New Mexico used the gas chamber, but then if it's historical, like that's a classic way. To start off a cop story as this brooding sheriff. It's no country for old men. Just knowing, if you read the back of the book, that there's a sheriff and there's, he's, there's this oncoming, you know, crazy world and it's a no country for old men. And he says that. That's very nostalgic. I think that's very a very beautiful first line. So next we have The Road, which I just accidentally read. But, quote, when he woke in the woods in the dark and the cold of the night, he'd reach out to touch the child sleeping beside him. Man, and that's really good too. That's another, I mean, we just got another classic line. I'm gonna read that one more time and let you guys decide. When he woke in the woods in the dark and the cold of the night, he'd reach out to touch the child sleeping behind him. Wow. That has to go in the classic category also because that shows you when the use of his language and the way that it is written makes you know that the father is doing this time and time again that this isn't like they're camping and he reaches out and he touches it no this is like a, a routine like you already are thrown into the darkness with just this one line the father is worried he's touching out he's reaching out to make sure that he's there there's all these different emotions in just one line so just to quickly reorder these i think that cities of the plains better than blood meridian um i think no country for old men and the road ah and the road beat outer dark. I think the outer dark one was a little bit too lengthy. And these are just much more compact if I'm writing on first lines. All right. And I think Suchery, you know, compared to these two, man, I think No Country for Old Men might be better than Suchery. And yeah, I'll put the road up there too, man. People <laughs> people always hated on the the ending and the start on the ending of the road, but what about the start of the road? All right. So next we have the passenger, Cormac McCarthy's recent publication it had snowed lightly in the night and her frozen hair was gold and crystalline and her eyes were frozen cold and hard as stone i mean guys this is absolute fire here i mean this is what this i mean this is this is fire that is fire you get so much here we get cormac mccarthy's beautiful prose but we're also knowing that something has gone wrong it had snowed lightly in the night and her frozen hair was gold and crystalline and her eyes were frozen cold and hard as stones. We know she's dead. We know that she's frozen, or at least something has gone terribly wrong. But there's crystalline. Her frozen hair was gold and crystalline. I mean, this is... I remember when I first read this, I, I, I knew the passenger was going to be good. And all the passenger haters out there, sit down. It's a good book. And as they say, when one sits, another stands. And the person standing up next is Stella Morris with this beautiful opening. Patient is a 20-year-old Jewish Caucasian female. Oh, never mind. That's not a very good first line. That is some hot trash right there, Cormac. Making us do another dialogue-only book, man. Give us more, Cormac. Sit down, Cormac. Even though I love Stella Maris and the, the way that it was written, I understand unless you were a super fan that you probably aren't going to be making it through that book, especially if you read it like as a standalone. So boom, everyone, let me know your picks. Let me know what I got wrong, what I got right. Do first lines even matter? And yo, thank you for being a part of this community. We are killing it. The Cormac McCarthy content is just going to keep coming. I have hundreds of ideas like this and we're going to keep this train rolling. Peace.